Well, welcome back from uh, the, the breakout sessions. Hope you all had a great time learning uh, some various things about this incredibly diverse conference. Uh, all the different flavors and countries represented and so forth. Thanks also to many of the sponsors that um, supported those uh, breakout sessions. Um, and now before we get started on our next general session, um, we're going to give you, uh, actually I want to announce our newest um, CI digital media initiative, the World Culinary Arts Project, which many of you know um, over the years, uh, which has been running actually for 18 years. And our newest um, documentary series in this, uh, in this program is called American Barbecue. Um, the series has been uh, supported for 18 years by Unilever Food Solutions, has won two James Beard Awards, and uh, I think as many of you know, it explores the best in food and cooking around the world. And really, the, the impetus for that program, together with this conference series, was to try to bring the, the world closer together. You all are, are, are busy chefs and operators. You can't get everywhere you're curious about, so we've been trying to bring the world to you and to our industry over time. Um, you can watch the new full barbecue video series and download the recipes by visiting ciproshef.com forward slash WCA for World Culinary Arts. Um, and now for a sneak preview of the new series, we have a brief introduction to World Culinary Arts American Barbecue to share with you. Let's roll the video. It's dirty, it's greasy, it's long, it's hot, it's hard hours. If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. You know, it, it makes me feel good when I see a customer here, a customer say, hey, this is the best. That makes me feel good. I know I done did my job. These are the baby back ribs. They're smoked for about two hours on the smoker, and then they're chilled down, and then we pick them up on a grill for service. So something good to pick up. It's got a pineapple, tamarind, barbecue sauce. So the way we mop through it, we're going to start on our legs first. We don't want to mop it, I say, more than four times because it'll start picking up the seasoning. We just shut the lid back down. You know, you just sit down on the table and you start talking to the guy in front of you and, oh, where are you from? Oh, what got you here? Because when you come here, you're in my backyard. Um, I really want to just uh, take a minute to thank Unilever Food Solutions for their incredible support um, over the last 18 years in supporting this series and getting our teams out around the world and bringing all this great uh, material back to us. So let's have a round of applause for their support. Okay, next we're going to move on to um, another one of our location uh, shots. Uh, as, as you can uh, well imagine, our original plan was to invite the chefs from Mexico and South America to come in, in, and join us live, but uh, of course we got a lot of travel restrictions that are still out there, but fortunately through the miracle of uh, virtual viewing, um, they're able to join us. And so now we're going to go live to uh, Latin America for a taste of Panama, a multicultural culinary experience with two culinary ambassadors, Elena Hernandez and Isaac uh, Villaverde, uh, who are both based in uh, Panama City. We're gonna start with a video that they prepar prepared and then we're gonna hear from Elena and Isaac uh, who will join us live right after that. So let's roll the video for that. Panama is in the heart of the Americas, a small strip of land nestled between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Just a one hour car ride to cross from one coast to the other. Because of this geographical advantage, Panama has always been a place for transit, trade, and opportunities. From the Spanish that crossed the Gulf from South America to Europe, the French and the Americans that led the world famous Panama Canal project, and the many workers that traveled from China, Africa, and the Caribbean island to help build it, immigrants from all over the globe like Italian, Greek, Israeli, Venezuelan, and Colombians, among others, have chosen Panama as their home 
and thus have influence and shape our gastronomy. I am Isaac Villaverde. And I am Elena Hernandez. And this is a taste of Panama in a one day journey. We begin our morning tour at Café Unido with a cup of coffee. But not just any coffee. Panamanian specialty coffee is world renowned for its excellent quality. The most precious and exotic coffee beans grow in our country. A rare variety known as geisha. Geisha traveled from the Geisha village in Ethiopia, arriving in the highlands of Panama in the 1960s, where it found the perfect microclimates and terroir to grow successfully and produce the most expensive coffee in the world. Geisha coffee is distinguished for its floral and fruity notes. Mandarin oranges, papaya mango, jasmine, and bergamot. Café Unido has made a name for itself in Panama. The company directly sources sustainable beans from more than 15 small farms and has recently opened its first coffee shop in the United States. We are ready to dive into one of the most notorious and beloved culinary experiences in Panama City, the Chinese dim sum. The Chinese community in Panama began to form in the latter half of the 19th century in 1854 with the arrival of the Clipper Sea Witch with the first group of Chinese laborers to work on the Panama Railroad. We are thrilled by how the Chinese dim sum has become part of our Panamanian food repertoire. Favorite dim sum items include shumai, hakao, pork paos, jichi kao, and soy kao, which is a fried dumpling filled with trim, a recipe adapted to the Panamanian palate. For decades, Palacio Lung Fun has been key in the process of building a bridge between the Panamanian and the Chinese culture, making the experience a moment of happiness, fun, and enjoyment for all of us. In Latin America, empanadas are a big thing. Fried, baked, made with wheat or corn flour, there are many options. This Venezuelan place, with two locations in Panama City, and another soon to open in Miami serves one of the best empanadas in town. The dough is made from harina pan, the traditional white corn flour used in South America for arepas and empanadas. Their signature empanada is stuffed with pabellón, the Venezuelan national dish, shredded skirt steak cooked in a flavorful sofrito sauce, rice, black beans, cheese, and fried sweet plantains. The dough is rolled out to the perfect thickness to produce a nice, crispy texture when fried. We tried other authentic products like the mandoca, a typical fritter made with plantains, corn and cheese from the Caribbean coast of Venezuela. For our authentic Panamanian Criollo dishes, we head off to family-owned El Trapiche, where second-generation chef Domingo de Valdia will prepare our national dish, Sancocho, in the traditional way over a wood fire pit. The chicken pieces are sauteed with chopped onions, culantro, seasoned with salt, and then covered in water. When the chicken is cooked, he adds pieces of ñame, a tuber similar to yam, and lets it cook until tender. In Panama, we can enjoy this dish at any moment of the day. It is also our go-to hangover and cold remedy. The National Trinity is made of a big bowl of steaming sancocho, white rice, and a fried rye plantain. For lunch, we head off to have Israeli street food, followed by an authentic Caribbean food experience, Mexican tropical tacos, and out-of-this-world desserts. Follow us! Lula is in the historic district of Casco Viejo, a UNESCO World Heritage Site with its colonial architecture, charming rooftops, and cobblestone streets. It is a hub for restaurants and nightlife in our city. Israeli-born chef Ayelet Banish trained in Tel Aviv and Paris, and then moved to Panama 20 years ago. Inspired by her family recipes, she serves Israel-inspired street food using local ingredients, like these corn empanadas stuffed with chicken shawarma and dipping tahini sauce. 
a sweet plantain cooked in butter, brown sugar, and citrus juice spiced with cinnamon, then dip in tempura mix and fry. We end our visit tasting a Middle Eastern favorite, sabir, served ramen style, a bed of hummus, grilled eggplant, pickled onion, a scotch egg, and pico de gallo. One of the theories is that the word Panama means abundance of fish and butterflies in native dialect. And because we are surrounded by thousands of miles of water, fish and seafood are an important part of our food culture. La Tapa del Coco is a temple for Afro-Caribbean cuisine in the city, which has its roots in the islands of the Caribbean, mainly from Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. We arrive here just in time for Isaac to show us his famous fried fish recipe. Whole sea bass or snappers marinated in onions, garlic, white vinegar or lemon juice, curry powder, cumin, parsley, chives, and culantro, then dipped in flour and deep fried. Served typically with a coconut rice with beans and patacones, this is an iconic dish representing the Afro influence in our gastronomy. La neta is a taqueria with a tropical twist using local ingredients. Margaritas are prepared with passion fruit or hibiscus flower juice, a perfect pairing for any of the items on the menu. Today, we come for Los Tacos Don Picaña, filled with top round cap cooked slowly with spices. The tortillas are covered with melted mozzarella cheese and chicharrones, chimichurri, and very thin fried onions. They offer a vegan option with plant-based meat made with beets and locally made vegan cheese, a mole tomatillo sauce with a hint of Panamanian coffee. For a great ending, we tried a Moroccan-inspired taco made with fresh grilled local fish and covered in a tasty tomato sauce, chickpeas, onions, and cilantro. Panamanians have a sweet tooth, so we are headed to the home of celebrity chef and cookbook author Pukit Arias de Calvo, known for being an ambassador of contemporary Panamanian cuisine. This time we came for desserts, and to begin, a creamy coconut paleta soaked in four leches sauce topped with a perfect scoop of Italian meringue decorated with edible flowers and gold leaves. Next, tiramisu finished at the table. Layers of delicate lady fingers and Nutella are soaked with Panamanian geisha coffee and finished with a canel of mascarpone and cream and dusted with cocoa. Finally, Kukita's signature baked Alaska with a fudgy brownie base and dulce de leche, chocolate ice cream, silky Swiss meringue, and wrapped in homemade cotton candy. Creative, decadent, delicious. Can't get better than this. Now, we are headed for the last stretch of this delicious journey. It's dinner time. Paris-born chef Fabian Mini arrived in Panama 25 years ago, bringing with him his work experience at Michelin star restaurants from back home. His place is a favorite spot for traditional French rotisserie chicken, seasoned with only natural ingredients and roasted to perfection. He serves it with tiny potatoes that are slowly bathed with chicken drippings and a fresh green salad of frise and fresh herbs. We tried his signature pate made with whipped chicken livers, cracked black pepper and covered with pork jelly. Followed by a traditional terrine de campagne made with pork and pistachios served on crusty bread, cornichon and Dijon mustard. Finally, a decadent apple tart, caramel sauce, and artisan vanilla ice cream. A perfect way to begin our evening food tour. Panamanian chef Francisco Castro has a passion for local ingredients, traditional recipes, and modern techniques. At Madu, he serves us torrejitas, rich sweet corn fritters that are deep fried and served with a delicate yogurt and tarragon sauce. Next, 
eggplant baba ganoush, creole sofrito, and local pork chorizo over thin hojadres, a typical fried bread served commonly at breakfast or in fondas all over the country. Ceviche is widely served and enjoyed in Panama. Madu's ceviches has fresh sea bass, thinly sliced peppers, ginger, red onions, crispy fried strip of purple yam, topped with coconut citrus foam. Finally, grilled jumbo shrimp over guacho, a soupy rice with a thick consistency usually made with pigeon peas, seafood, or smoked pork tail. A fonda is a food stall, usually found in the countryside during festivals or carnivals. Bloque I occupies a renovated building in Colonial Casco Viejo, with an open kitchen where Le Cordon Bleu trained chef Jose Carles turns simple, humble dishes into a creative, fun culinary experience. First, we try a thin yuca cracker covered with local tuna tartar and onion ceviche, followed by congolón, giant jasmine rice cakes crispy on one side and stuffed on the other side, served with a smoky tomato sauce. Next, octopus in a coconut milk and curry sauce served with patacones. For dessert, raspao, shaved ice served with different flavored fruit syrups, sweet condensed milk, and malted milk powder. This is Panama in four dishes. A perfect finale, we arrive at Maito, the only Panamanian restaurant on the Latin America 50 best restaurant list. Chef Mario Castrellon's Spanish-American Panamanian background has played an important role in his way to approach food. His food is playful, combining local ingredients with the diversity of cultural influences present in our country. Carimagnola's crispy yuca croquettes filled with delicate beef tartare arrive as we begin our last dinner. Followed by arroz negro maito, a black paella style dish with grilled calamari and aioli sauce, corn gnocchi with a coconut and pigeon pea sauce and white cheese. Finally, strawberries and cream, a delicate olive oil ice cream, local strawberries in citrus escabeche, cheese cream, and strawberry glass. Simply spectacular. And voila, we hope you enjoyed our tour of our favorite food spots in tropical, colorful, tasty, fun, and multicultural Panama City. We also hope this was inspiring for you, and we invite you to visit us in the near future. Hasta luego. Hopefully you were able to see that video also. Also, while we have you on here, I just wanna have everybody give you a round of applause for that. Um, partially also because I am impressed that you made it through that whole one day eating what seemed to be about three or four meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, tell us more about that process of filming this video and the places that you went to. Well, it actually took us around four days. <laughs> it wasn't in one day. It's impossible. That, that makes me feel better because I was feeling a little bit like I don't, I, I am clearly not the eater I proclaim to be that you guys were able to do that. So four days. And, and, um, and how did you sort of connect with all of these chefs and restaurants to feature them? How did you choose these chefs and restaurants to feature them in the video? Um, well, in the end, it's like Panama is super diverse in terms of the culture and, and the, the regions of the world. And uh, and Anna has been in, has been a chef, a respected, well-known chef in Panama for many years. Um, I'm part of a younger generation, but Elena uh, was a founder of the Panama Gastronomica, which is the, the greatest uh, food event that we've ever had in Panama. So. When, when we came up with the idea, it's like, we want to present the diversity of our city, and not just a, a technique or any ingredient in particular, but, you know, showcase uh, how diverse we are. So we picked the restaurants or the cuisines that could, you know, manifest that diversity. So we went from dim sum to coffee to fried fish to 
it's a big, you know, we, we're all over the place trying to show you the best of the best in kind of see. I love that. And are these, so are these restaurants and, the, and these chefs that you were showing us, are they places that sort of people would go to on an everyday, are they hidden gems? Are they kind of well-known places um, for the people who live there? Um, what's sort of the range of, of notoriety, I suppose, for these restaurants that you were showing us? Well, definitely. Um, we have um, the best chefs or the most renowned chefs in this video. I, I, I hope that everyone, everyone here is going to go back and watch the whole video because at the end, you will see the only restaurant in Panama that is named in the Latin American Fidesz restaurants. So, I'm sorry you didn't see that, but that's like uh, my talk, and uh, he's uh, a very well-renowned chef, and then Kikita is the, it's like the Marcos Square of Panama, she's a very, very well-known chef, and uh, then Fabian and Francisco, all the chefs are very well-known, and these places are very well-known also. So if you come here, these are the places that we, our favorite places that we hope uh, you can go to and experience. A little bit of Panama. And Elaine. Uh, these are places where Panamanians will go, like local people will go to eat, which is important too, you know. And I love that you represented in that video, as you said, sort of the diversity of cuisines. You know, for me, I had no idea that dim sum is in Panama and that I could go. And it feels like a very familiar experience seeing those carts, but that that is in Panama. That's amazing that it has that diversity. We have, you a, come, we have a Chinatown here also. Like if you come and, uh, and stay with a Panamanian family, they will take you to Panamanian breakfast and it will be dim sum. I love that. I love that. That's great. So if somebody from Panama comes and visits San Francisco and I take them to dim sum, I'm also serving them Panamanian breakfast. Is that right? <laughs> kind of, yes. I like that. And Elena, just um, just to call out, are we seeing a bit of Panama in your background here also? Oh, yes. Uh, actually, today is a national holiday. Yesterday was Independence Day, and today is Flag Day, so we are on holiday days. And I am in the Caribbean, and Isaac is in the Pacific. So we are at both ends. Like I said in the beginning of the video, it only takes one hour. Actually, where I am, it took three hours to come from the city. But here is the Atlantic. Ocean, yes, and it's a real background. It's not like the. <laughs> 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 that is amazing. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I feel like between your video, which we will be posting um, online so that people can watch it, also from um, beginning to end and see all of the amazing chefs and dishes that you um, that you represented. And also, thank you so much for joining us and showing us literally the two sides of Panama um, from end to end. Thank you so much. And we can't wait for you to come here and for us to be able to go back to Panama also. Thank Thank you so much. So from Panama, we are coming back a little bit closer to home here, or at least back to the Bay Area. Um, for this next session, we're going from Seattle and Lexington to Oakland, finding one's culinary voice through the knowledge and lessons of ancestors. And to guide us through this session, um, I'm so pleased to welcome back to the Worlds of Flavor stage. If you've been here before, you are very familiar with her. If you're a reader of Plate Magazine, you're also very familiar with her. Um, if you're familiar with the James Beard Awards and IACP. You're also familiar with her, so really just a friend to us all. Um, Chandra Ram, who is a grad of the Culinary Institute of America. Um, she's also the vice chair of the James Beard Foundation Journalism Awards, chair of IACP Cookbook Awards, and a cookbook author herself. So please help me welcome Chandra Ram. Thank you so much, Jackie. I should um, ask you to hype me up like every morning before I get started. <laughs> but thank you all so much for being here, and thank you to you know Jackie, Greg, Christina, everyone at the CIA for pulling this off. Um, I think the conversation I've had most frequently in the last couple of days has been 
Oh, thank God, we're just such, it's so lovely to be here and to be among everyone uh, here today. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about this, uh, to introduce this next topic. Um, we're talking about finding one's culinary voice through the knowledge and lessons of ancestors. Um, and I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about the fact that like a few years ago, I wrote a cookbook, and it was about Indian food. and. Oddly, like through the whole process of writing the proposal and coming up with a table of contents and that, it seemed on the face of it fairly straightforward. But it quickly became complicated as soon as people started asking me if the book and its recipes would be authentic. Because I have such a problem with that term and I have really no idea what it means, except nine times out of 10, it means that the person asking me about whether what I was doing was authentic wanted some reassurance that my grandmother in India had done the exact same thing. And it's something like people get so caught up in grandmothers and I always think, you know, there's, there's a bunch of grandmothers out there who are terrible cooks, right? Like, and I'm not saying that about my grandmother, please do not get my aunties on me on that. But, it goes back to this nature of what connects us to authenticity. The book had some traditional recipes. There are recipes that, dishes that resonated with my family, my brothers, and my mother and I talked about, you know, eating lunches and dinners together, you know, at the big table at my grandparents' house in India. But there were also a lot of other recipes that would only be authentic if they were authentic to someone, to me someone who is half Indian, half Irish, who grew up in Kentucky, lives in Chicago in a neighborhood that is strongly German, Korean, and adjacent to a wonderful Lebanese community. And that last nine line is not what people expect when they're looking at who's writing this Indian cookbook, but it helps establish, or at least I think, I hope, reset expectations. Because none of us is a monolith. And that's, that's something I think needs to be, we need to be reminded of over and over again. And I say that to, to open up a series of cooking demonstrations and conversations about how each of us finds our culinary voice. And to begin by saying it's important for chefs to be able to acknowledge the past while unapologetically putting their imprint on the food they create and in doing so, advance a conversation about their culture, not, let, not feeling like it has to remain behind glass and be this precious thing, but it can evolve just as much as the rest of the world evolves. Our, our presenters this morning tackle this challenge daily. They cook distinctly personal food that is informed by their heritage, good and bad, as when elements like colonialism and slavery come into play, but equally informed by the present and by their hopes, their wishes for what their culture will experience in the future. They communicate that vision to customers who might have a singular and entirely different vision for how thick a sauce should be, for the spices that should season a style of biryani, or how a plate of food should look when it hits the table. And so they come to us from Seattle, from Lexington, Kentucky, from Oakland, California, knowing that we may have ideas about what a chef from each of these places can or should cook, and prepared to help expand our horizons with what they do. They come with their food and with a desire to help answer these questions. What do we build upon when we cook? Whose knowledge, whose history, whose journeys pave the way for what we express on a plate? What joys and pains figure in there? What do we share with others through our food? And how do we use that to build connections inside and outside our community? Our first chef today comes to us from Oakland, nearby. Dominica Rice Cisneros is a chef and the owner of Bombera in Oakland. Her culinary approach was honed at Chez Panisse, where she spent six years working directly with Alice Waters. Emphasizing local, organic, and whole foods, Dominica has played a pivotal role in placing California-based Mexican cuisine in conversation with the need to protect biodiversity, as well as her Mexican heritage. And we're thrilled that she's also here today with Gloria Dominguez from Tamarindo Restaurant in San Francisco, who's been doing quite a lot of this work, making that connection with Mexico. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage to continue this conversation. World Flavors and um, Copa and all the students here, we love you guys, are amazing. I'm gonna cry because it makes me feel like you know, remembering when I was a student in San Francisco, I moved to the Bay Area from Los Angeles in uh, 93, 
and I really applaud all the students helping us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for making it possible. And all the teachers and mentors. So I am a classically trained French, French chef, and most of the culinary schools in the United States start there, and then add on other curriculum. And these pictures are all- Domenica, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure everybody can hear you. So if you're able to project just a little bit oh, yeah. louder, it'd be great. Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid this thing's going to fall off, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> so um, these images that are uh, above right now, these are all from my traveling. So part of me wanting to become a chef, stay a chef, is kind of just a, you know, facilitate my traveling needs and always knowing I can find a job where I go. So I landed, you know, I was born and raised in Los Angeles and when I was 19 I left and came to the Bay Area, started culinary school and um, it goes off from there to New York for two years, to Mexico City for two years, then back to San Francisco and Berkeley to work with Alice and then back and they, then they sent me to Italy and then I came back. So knowing that they are always kind of having mentors and keeping those mentors and um, is very important to me. And I was able finally in 2011 was to open Cosecha restaurant. And that's my Mexican American Chicana Pride um, Cafe in downtown Oakland. And we've recently closed it and opened a new restaurant called Bombera, a project I've been working on for four years. And it's inside of a, an abandoned uh, fire station in Oakland, in the heart of Oakland. Um, my sister here, my sister my, uh, of the kitchen, Gloria, she's my, my she's um, uh, definitely set the tone in downtown Oakland with Tamarindo restaurant, with an elevated cocktail list, mezcal list, um, Mexican cuisine, with always attention to California style that we have here in the Bay Area that's so important and unique. Um, and then I was able to be a neighbor and work with Mix to your restaurant. We were about a block away. You're a block away from each other and her family was just so amazing and kind of helped set the tone and people knew downtown Oakland to be a place of um, like this Mexican American pride. And we had La Borgueña, we also had Mexicali Rose. So there was a, definitely a good anchor in downtown Oakland that was very Mexican-American, Chicano, and Mexican pride. Now it's changed since COVID, and uh, a lot of those places have closed. And um, I think there's only one restaurant right now hanging on. But they're doing great, and I'm just um, I'm happy that we're still in Oakland, and it's been huge for us. And one of our main dishes that we make is this pozole verde. And today we have it with pork, and we usually make it with chicken. And this is something that's like on the menu every single day. And pozole is a corn-based soup. It could be vegetarian. Um, it, it's just mostly a corn broth. So my, my tia Lupe calls it her Acapulco, her Acapulco pozole. And she gave me the um, recipe. And whenever I have it on the menu, she always gets a check, a dividend at the end of the month for her contribution of giving us the recipe. And it's just been something, um, everybody asks for the recipe and I never give it to anybody, except for like today. Today's like the first time. So I'm so happy that you guys are here and, um, uh, and I'm really, really proud to be here. So I want you to see this is very important. So when I'm cooking, I need to see, I go to the farmer's market every Tuesday, 85% of all of my veggies are coming from the ecology center in um, the Oakland Berkeley border on Alcatraz, Adeline. I hope to see all of you chefs there on Tuesday at one o'clock every week. And um, it's a big hub, but to get to that level, to become 85% straight from the mercado or direct from the farm, no middleman. And it's very, it's very, um, it sets the stage. It makes my life uh, a little harder, but the end, a little easier because the veggies are just so good. They kind of just do the work, right? They should just do the work for you, right? And they're not in the refrigeration with, you know, a middleman for a month getting dehydrated. So it's like we went this morning to the Hudson Market right here at Oxbow. And we got this. This is, this is the secret ingredient. If you can find or grow your own ceboyin for the soup, this is, this is it. Because some of them are so yummy, they taste like garlic. And so for me, I, this is like the first thing I look for. But um, 
I wanted to let you know also besides all the all the verdes, if you're missing something and you want to make this, go ahead and make it. If you're not, if you don't have tomatillos, I'm using red green. Uh, I'm using just the, the green tomatoes. So um, don't get all upset because you don't have the the lechuga or the radish tops. The radish tops were horrible, so I'm using turnip tops. You know, like don't 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 start just looking at the recipe and getting stifled. Like go for it, and. Um, the main thing with this broth is that we have a pozole. So Rancho Gordo, we have a lot of farms also in the Southwest that have all the nice um, dry pozoles and that you can cook while you're with the meat at the same time. And they cook up in around 40 minutes. And it gives you that, the broth has a really nice corn, white corn flavor. And this right here is just a straight corn that you would have to mix them out. You would have to simmer this with gal for at least a good like 40 minutes, algo así. And then you let it soak overnight and then you would rinse it off, take all the skin off of it, and then it becomes a nixtamal that can become a pozole. The pozole means that the, the corn is already simmered and it's blossoming. So we can check this to see if it's opening up a little bit. But this is like, so it's opening up a little bit, a little bit right there, I can see it. So we're gonna put up the, can turn the heat a little higher for me, Gloria. So um, the soup is like very seasoned. I like to season it with garlic, onions. Um, this has a pork shoulder that's been cut into like five pieces. It looks about maybe two pounds and then simmer it with water. You don't have to add another chicken broth. Again, the thing is that you really want the corn to shine. So adding water kind of um, helps that, that corn sweetness come out. You're not kind of pork and chicken fighting for attention. So um, also an aromatic that's very important to the soup is the, um, I like to add it to the broth, is the Mexican oregano. I like to add it towards the end, but it has to get broken up, otherwise it's too bitter. And I like to simmer it with a salt as well, and then just let it simmer. It takes about, like, casi an hour and a half, two hours, yeah. And then you, once it starts blossoming, then you can add, you can eat the soup así. Pozole blanco, we're ready. It's more like a consomme, and it's, it's a beautiful soup. But, but you can go usually red in my family, and that's with guajillo chilies and garlic. And then for us, we're gonna go jalapeno. We're gonna go, if you have serranos, use serranos, if you don't have jalapenos. The main thing is, I think, if you don't have any of the other greens, it's just the cilantro, green onion, jalapeno, and garlic, and you're there. Like, make this dish at home. This is this beautiful dish to make for Sunday suppers as well, and Sunday breakfast for brunch. And my grandma would always do soups when it was really hot outside, she was making a pot of soup. And the whole thing is to get your perspiring and you're cooling off and you're eating a caldo and it's spicy and then you, it, yeah, and it cools you off. And my grandma's a desert woman from Chihuahua. And so for us, it was just so nice um, growing up in her kitchen and then bringing, um, items that she always kind of had a problem finding so she would grow herself, you know, and be an urban farmer. And she um, started her family in California in the 50s and then we are still there. So we're like a very proud uh, Mexican American family and this is part of who I am and how we eat every weekend. So for my restaurant, it is all about what do we want to eat for the season? What is, you know, pan de muerto we have traditional ceremonial breads, we have things that we want to share with the community. But the thing is, it's always about things that the cooks and the senoras and the tortilla masters want to eat. It's never like us trying to experiment and like you guys are the guinea pigs. It's like things we crave is what we put on our menu. And that's where our heritage comes in. And it's like, you know, sticking to recipes, but adding a little bit of toque, a little extra on top of it. Like my grandma would never put a purple daikon radish in her pozole offerings. Okay, you know what I mean? So, the, But I would, and I will, because the red ones were so ugly. I'm like, let's go purple daikon. So things like that, that you can kind of, being a Mexican American, kind of free up and not be so terrified with, you know, experimentation a little bit. So we're just gonna quickly blend up um, the herbs, the lechuga, the green onion, and then we're gonna add it to the soup. And then the fun part of the soup is that we put all these toppings on at the end. 
So you get to, you know, add your own as the person. You get to see how much onion, uh, lemon juice, and cabbage you want to top your soup with. So these are the things that would be in the center of the table, and everybody can grab and add a little bit more jalapeno, because you know, mom likes it spicy. You know, so things like that. So let's blend this together really quick with some of the hot broth and garlic. I add lechuga, I add radish tops to this because it definitely gives a really nice heartiness. And it's almost like a, I want to say like a fluffiness to the soup, but um, let's see, what else? I think the radish tops keep it green longer as well. And that just takes the bitterness away. The bitterness away, exactly. So we have, I invited Gloria today at the end for tomorrow's demo. We're working for this for tomorrow morning. It's the gusano beans that we get from our campesinos who are from Oaxaca, and they work with Dirty Girl Farms. So this is the demo we're gonna be doing tomorrow morning. Um, Chef Gloria, while I do this, um, talk about, you, you know, Chef Gloria is a very special teacher, chef, and, and um, mentor. Um, there's a really big conference in Mexico, and they had asked her to curate a team of people from Canada, US, to kind of re represent that California vibe. So I was able to go and she invited me and... Well, they needed a, a chef that uses the ingredients, yes, all ingredients from Mexico, so yes, that's how the chef is going to be. I believe in her and what she was doing, and so she represented California. Um, yeah. The pozole verde, like she says, or the grandma calls it Acapulco. So Acapulco is Guerrero, the state of Guerrero. So a lot of the people from Guerrero are from Oh, nice. And, but, you know, everybody has their own recipe. Every home and every restaurant does. Uh, this was pretty amazing. But also, um, I think it's the, each region puts whatever they grow in their area. Like, Guerrero has uh, Yerba Santa. They put a pasote. Yeah. They even put radish uh, leaves. Yeah. And each, I mean, totally different. Exactly. And, uh, and it was really nice. Like going to the conference in Mexico was mind blowing. The it is something I invite you guys to go check out when they start up again. The women all have UNESCO status, which they talked about in Pan the Panama uh, featured, which means they they have a heritage stake in representing their state, and they've been chosen to represent their state. So going to a conference there, you're not just seeing these women and working with these women and eating the food. You're also having plates and ceramic plates for your little botana, your appetizers are from barro, artesanía from that state. So you have such a, an amazing, uh, like each, each area of this conference in Mexico, the Foro Gastronomía de las Mujeres de Mexico, Gastronomía mundial. mundial. And it's, you know, it was like one section here in Chiapas. And so this is, a, the first year I went was held in Mexico City. And then the second year you invited me, we were in Long Beach. So they, they are making the effort to come here and they brought the women here from Oaxaca. It was mind blowing. So this is something, if you like food conferences, this is something definitely right up your alley. And it's just amazing what it, how it changed so much for um, the señoras in Mexico to be able to travel around and rep their states with such pride. And, you know, and we get spoiled. And it's so good, it's so good. So once this is boiled, I try to uh, keep the soup um, almost at like the lowest setting because I don't want the grains to start changing color, but it actually holds up really well. The radish tops or the turnip tops and um, the herbs kind of like straight, stay real true to their, um, their, you know, green. So this is, the last step is just that little, once everything's nice and tender, and you add this and you can check for a little bit of seasoning. 
But I do like to keep the broth. I just start it with salt and season it a little bit as we go. But right here, this is, let me taste this real quick for salt. Thank you. Okay, look at that color. I'm just so happy with this color. Okay, so this, I like it. I like it. And then um, I don't want it to get, the thing is the salt is really nice. Like the last second of this, of a, a dried oregano, it has to be a Mexican oregano, or it could be something fresh from the garden, but don't use any of the dried Italian oregano, otherwise, ay Dios mio, guacala. <laughs> it's gonna be disgusting. I don't know, no, 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 no. Mejor something fresh from the garden, it makes a big difference. So what we do now is something that, you can help me with a little bit of tostadas. I'm gonna show you real quick, is this a little onion relish we're doing here? And so this is chopped onion, with, and we're gonna add some of the fresh oregano, some of the dried oregano if you have it, some cilantro, and the radish, and lemon juice. And then I like to add a little, my, this is my tia Lupe that taught me how to do this, was the salted cheese from uh, Mexico, the Cotija. And we were really happy, we, um, we drove, Gloria and I drove around, I'm adding, a little bit of avocado, lemon, a little oil, and this salty cheese. So um, if you don't have the cotija, don't worry about it. It just adds that saltiness. So this is why I've added salt to the broth, but I'm not going crazy because I know I have this here. And um, it's just really beautiful. This is like one of my favorite things. This, I could eat every single day on every single taco as a side dish. Just that chopped onion and avocado and radish, I just love, and a little um, salt. But this is definitely something that I would make and keep in the refrigerator as a little side crunchy, crunchy. Yeah, 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 you got it. This is something I never did as a kid. I never had the tostadas with the pozole, but this is what you, this is. To the side. But she's a Mexicana, and this is what you do when you're eating pozole, is this, it's salsa crema, the sour cream, cabbage, hot sauce, and that's your little tortilla with your soup. Whatever you please do. Yeah, and for me as a kid, it would be more about um, the fresh corn tortillas and then dunking that into um, you know, dunking. The, for me, I like the soft tortillas, but this is more classic. And so this is where people are like, oh, where is that you're cooking from? Like, what is this? What part of Mexico, that's the question I get a lot, like, what part of Mexico is this type of food from? And I always say, it's from Oakland. <laughs> because <laughs> Oakland used to be Mexico, okay? It's like we always try to pretend we don't remember any of that. But it, you know, it used to, Vallejo, tenemos Vallejo, tenemos San Francisco, Los Angeles, I mean, California, I mean, everything is in Spanish, people. Like, remember, like we're here, we've been here. There's a 200 year pride of Mexican American pride here. And we're just, you know, and we're not going anywhere. <laughs> and we're just bringing it to you. So this is how I like to brunch, okay? This is how, I, this is how we do this. This is, this is cosecha, this is bombera, this is Mexican American, this is Mexico, and thank you for inviting us. I feel like you guys are probably like me, very tempted to like rush the stage and grab that bowl of soup. But thank you so much, Dominica and Gloria, for sharing your traditions, sharing your food. And sharing that recipe. I hope your tia doesn't find out that you gave it to all of us, but we're family. So from learning about these Mexican traditions as interpreted through a very personal lens and brought to us via Oakland, California. We're gonna, sh we're gonna shift a little bit north and to a different culture, a different chef, uh, a different point of view. Our next chef today is Hillel Echo Hawk. She is an indigenous cook 
caterer and speaker from Alaska. She received her degree from the Seattle Culinary Academy and has cooked in some of Seattle's most innovative restaurants. What I particularly love about what she's doing, she is the founder of Birch Basket, uh, a company she'll be telling us about shortly, and she speaks at conferences like these about indigenous food, sovereignty, and its intersections with the food that food has with social justice, colonialism, and environmental injustices. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Hillel Echo Hawk. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here, um, especially with those two amazing women. Uh, they're incredible um, to, to follow in their footsteps is amazing. Um, I, like, like Chandra said, I am from Alaska. Um, I currently live in Seattle, and I am going to be teaching you um, a little bit about uh, my, my people's <clears throat> um, blue corn. Um, the Pawnee Nation was originally in um, uh, Nebraska, in Kansas area. Um, in 1875, we were brought, and I say brought in quotes, uh, to Oklahoma. And through that, what we call the long walk, um, we lost a lot of our seeds and we lost a lot of our people through colonization and through genocide. Uh, and by the time we reached Oklahoma through uh, a series of years, uh, by the time 1910 came around and that census, there were uh, 996 of us. And, in, and, and when we tried to grow our seeds, it wasn't happening. Uh, seeds know where they need to grow, and they wouldn't grow. Year after year after year after year, the seeds would not grow. And it was a devastating thing that was happening to us, because in Kansas and Nebraska, along the Platte River, uh, we were incredible, incredible uh, gardeners. Uh, we had amazing, we had this amazing agriculture system, uh, very, very detailed uh, uh, system, uh, so many different varietals of so many different kinds of uh, beans and squash and corn and sunflowers and uh, uh, watermelons and different, just so many different things. We only went hunting twice a year for buffalo and different kinds of game, you know, throughout the year. Um, and so it was just absolutely devastating when we came to, to what is now the Pawnee Nation Reservation. And we were put onto, um, onto commodity foods, um, which at that time was uh, core, uh, um, flour, sugar, coffee, and um, canned meat. And people wonder why Native Americans have such high rates of diabetes um, and all sorts of other health issues. And it started then when we were put onto reservations and we were not allowed to grow our foods. Um, and so, and, and it was illegal to grow our foods. It was illegal to hunt. Um, and so, 
today I'm going to show you um, one of our first foods and our last foods that we would um, give our babies and our elders. Uh, and just eat all the time, really. Um, it's blue corn mush. It's um, like, like grits, but a little bit thinner. Um, so I've started a pot of boiling water. And I'm gonna make like a, like a wet sand mixture. Um, and the water is boiling now. Um, you make it like a wet sand mixture so it doesn't clump. I found that this is the best way. Uh, growing up in Alaska, I have I grew up eating moose and salmon and amazing berries and living a very uh, mostly subsistence lifestyle. Um, we grew up 100 miles from Fairbanks, and so it was you know, quite an ordeal to get, uh, to get food. Um, we had a very small uh, grocery store um, where, where I grew up. And so, you know, 100 miles one way was I don't know if anybody else has had that um, growing up, but you know, it's, it's not ideal to go 100 miles one way <laughs> to, to get food. Um, our, my parents would buy a half a cow, get it butchered, and we'd just have a fridge or a freezer full of you know, packages of, of meat. That would be our, our food for the winter. Um, it, was, it was interesting. Um, another thing was we were adopted into the upper on the Athabascan. No worries. We were adopted into the upper on the Athabascan uh, tribe of Mentasta Lake Village. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm wearing this sweater, um, because Katie John, uh, I grew up watching her fight the state of Alaska for hunting and subsistence rights, because she had the passion and the desire to fight, to teach us to fight, it seems very redundant, but it's true, to fight for the right to do what was done for hundreds of years, just to live, just to keep living for her people. But when colonizers came and when people that did not look like her and did not know what she was doing came and when she, and when those people came and took over her land and moved her from her traditional land to another land, told her that she couldn't hunt and fish, that she had to get a permit to hunt and fish on her traditional lands. She said no when they took her children and put them into boarding schools and told her that she had to get a permit to fish on her traditional lands, that she couldn't put a fish wheel up to feed her family, she said no and started to do that anyways. And her family was getting arrested for doing what they did for hundreds of years. She said no. And she eventually won. It took 25 years, but she eventually won. 
And I grew up watching that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm standing here in front of you all. And that passion and that, that woman is, is so amazing. And she, she's so inspiring to me and to my family that, that she would do that for us, that she would stand up for thousands of people, that she would say no, that it's not right that these people are telling me that I cannot do what is a natural born thing. That I, that I, I can't do that. You've already taken my children and put them into boarding schools that I can't talk to them in my language. And now you're telling me that I can't hunt and fish on my own land? No. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to have traditional camps. I'm going to teach my, my nieces and my nephews. I'm going to teach my grandchildren how to, how to, to, to traditionally hunt and traditionally fish and to traditionally uh, butcher uh, moose and salmon. And I remember going to these camps and have um, fish and game circle and, and helicopters and come in and arrest people and think that this is crazy. Like, why are they doing this? Why is this happening? And it's, it's, and now I'm, I'm looking at this blue corn and I'm realizing that it's the same thing with this blue corn. It was, oh, it was illegal for my people to grow this blue corn and we lost it. It was illegal for people to keep these seeds. And it was through the resilience of people in my tribe that we even have these seeds. It's incredible and it's amazing this pot of blue corn is here. Because of colonization and genocide, that out of 696 people, I am standing here in front of you telling you this story. And I hope that that out of anything that you have heard today, you just realize or, or hear or understand that Native people in the, what is now the United States of America are resilient, we are not going anywhere, no matter what colonization and genocide and the United States government and and food politics have to say about it. Two and a half minutes left, and, and, and I'm going to finish, finish this. Um, there, uh, 
<laughs> sweeten it with um, a little bit of uh, maple syrup or agave um, to your taste, basically. want it to be thin because you don't want kids to choke on it. And then you can top it with berries or granola or, or you know, whatever you want. Um, and that's blue corn mush. Um, Well, that, that story was beautiful, and I am so appreciative that, she, that you were able to come here today and, and share what happened, and I'm so glad that, uh, that the team at the CIA included that perspective because I think it's one that's often ignored in the conversation about regional foods in the United States and the not pretty history behind them, but I, um, she kind of kept saying like, oh, this is just like this simple bowl of blue corn mush, and I, I look at it, and I'm like, that is just, that's stunning. So I'm, I'm so glad to, uh, to have learned um, everything, like all of that just now, and encouraged to learn more. Um, our final chef uh, for this session uh, comes to us from Lexington, Kentucky. Samantha Four is a first-generation Sri Lankan American chef based there. Um, I actually, she and I have become good friends because um, that's, she, she lives and cooks in my hometown. And when I first heard about her, I said, well, that's weird because there's no Sri Lankan place. There's no Sri Lankan chefs in my hometown. I, I know everything that's going on there, but of course, as we've been saying, uh, you know, cities evolve, cooks evolve, cultures evolve, and I'm so glad I got to meet her and, importantly, um, have her food. She started her pop-ups, um, Sri Lankan or, or Tuk Tuk Sri Lankan Bites, in 2016 after hosting a series of traditional Sri Lankan brunches in her home and realizing that her dining room was no longer going to fit. Uh, the number of people who wanted to eat her food. Um, she's here today to share her Sri Lankan uh, upbringing in the American South and how she translates that onto the plate. And I'm particularly excited because she's cooking one of my absolute favorite dishes, uh, a Sri Lankan Southern tomato pie that uh, personally now just marks when it's July and when we've got the good tomatoes in. So please join me in welcoming Samantha Four to the stage. My name is Sam Four. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, the beautiful bluegrass state. And I cook Sri Lankan food in the middle of Kentucky in a tent. And for some reason, that got some traction, and I am here before you today, and I'm grateful for it. So my folks came over in the 70s. A lot of the South Asian community came over in the 70s on medical visas. So if you're coming from South Asia, if you're coming from Sri Lanka, an island that's about the size of West Virginia, you probably aren't going to get the same ingredients in Cincinnati, Ohio. Just a guess. You're probably not going to get the same seafoods. You're probably not going to get all the starches and staples that you're used to. So you make it work. So I try to make it work by creating familiar vehicles to share flavors that I grew up with. The tomato pie is actually based on a chili cheese toast that I would eat on a rooftop bar in a hotel in Sri Lanka every time I visited. You know, I take these moments, I take food moments that are important to me and are important to my culture, 
and I try to spin them into dishes that translate across. So one day I was talking out of my tail and uh, pretending that I knew what I was doing, and I said, I, why don't I make a roasted curry tomato pie? And the people who wanted the recipe said, oh, that sounds great. And I'm like, <laughs> I had never made it before. So in Sri Lanka, we have three different roasted curry powders, and we talk about the monolith thing. Indians use masalas, some folks use blends. In Sri Lanka, we use curry powder. It's always been a thing because we put the curry leaves in the powder. Powder, Ugh, powder too, huh? So we use varying roasts for varying ingredients. That is something that everyone is taught when they are learning to cook. My mother actually did not learn to cook until she was 27 and moved over here. And it became necessity to remember those three to five ingredients that you could find at a, at a market that would make your perfect curry powder, that would make your house blend. So I wanted to highlight roasted curry powder in this because it's so different. It's got a little touch of smokiness, but it also has all the beautiful herbs and spices that make Sri Lankan food unique. Sri Lankan food does not have a big stage in this country. I think this is about as big as it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> But I have had the chance to share a, what's so important to me and what's important to my family. And the way that I did it is I started following my mother around with a camera. When you are a first-gen kid from South Asia, you have roughly four career paths. Doctor, lawyer, accountant, engineer. I didn't want to be any of those. So I had to figure it out. Did some stints in music and tech, kind of tried to find my place. And in food, I found my place. I get to translate my childhood. I get to translate these dishes that I love, especially in a world that is changing so rapidly, even the food in Sri Lanka right now, because of trade, because of international influence, is changing. You know, 10 years ago, you couldn't get a nasi goreng there, and now you get one everywhere. So I wanted to introduce these flavors to folks in Kentucky, partially to get them out of my house but also to, um, to spread the virtue. I think Sri Lankan food's fantastic. I don't know why everyone else doesn't, but it's probably because they haven't had it. So this tomato pie felt like a coup because it's the first recipe I had ever submitted to Food and & Wine and it ended up on the cover, which was super cool. I had no idea that that was a thing and my phone was insane for about a month. But my biggest proud moment with that are the onions. So with the, oh, I need a knife. <laughs> it's right here. I was hiding things over here. I didn't think I was, sorry. So with the recipe, I submitted a tamarind onion topping. The tamarind onion topping is based on one of the most humble condiments in Sri Lanka. It's present on every table. To see Sini Sambal onions, on the cover of a magazine in America is something I would never have thought that I would see in my lifetime. But it happened, and it felt like a huge victory. So we're gonna make some Sini symbol. Everyone's got their recipes, everyone's got their ways, but mine tends to be a bit easy. I'm going to use a little bit of oil here. And we make do with the ingredients we've got. It's just a fact of being. And I probably should also make the crust, but let's get these onions started. There's a lot going on over here. <laughs> As we were growing up, our primary meals were, you know, rice and curries and, you know, everything my dad would eat. My dad's a rice guy. He wants to have the traditional food. He wants to, you know, feel at home when he's at home. Sri Lankan food also became a tool of gathering because there are not a ton of us here. So the ones that would find each other would pocket. Then every auntie would have their recipes. Everyone had their specialty. It's kind of like Thanksgiving, except it's all the time. And it became a really beautiful moment to watch the collaboration between aunties that are living here, mothers of kids that are trying to figure out meals, and making do with the ingredients in their region. Kentucky and Sri Lanka, not the same. But do they have some common threads through immigration, through colonization? Yeah. That's how a lot of the ingredients made it to Sri Lanka is because it was a trade hub back in the day. And it was controlled by various and sundry influences. So I am going to stir this up. 
I'm actually gonna add a little bit of chili pepper to this as well to flavor my oil up. We cook a lot with whole spices. We count on toasting them to open up their characteristics. And that's something that, you know, you can bloom a powdered spice, you can toast up a, a, a whole spice, but it really has an impact on building the layers of the dish. Sri Lankan food is a layering of flavors. You have to make your perfect bite with the perfect Sri Lankan plate. And so that is my quest, is to make the perfect bite for you. Um, but typically, it's a cuisine that lends to family style because we are inevitably gathering all the time. But the best way to learn proper Sri Lankan cooking is to follow the servants because in Sri Lanka there is still a servant class, there's still a very large class divide. However, they are the ones who know how to cook on open fire. They are the ones who know how to use all of the equipment that I've never seen before. So they don't chase me out because they're scared to. And I get to learn everything, so it's kind of fantastic. One of the main ingredients that we use over there is tamarind. We like the sour stuff. Uh, I think about a decade ago, Dr. Oz was hawking some sort of weight loss supplement, which is actually brindleberry. And that is a primary ingredient in every fish curry you have because it's nice and sour. We try to hit it on those. Ooh. I'm gonna turn that on. Now, you see I have two different kinds of tamarind here. I like to use the concentrate because it takes all the seeds out and makes my life easier. When they're done, they look like this. And with full tamarind, as we are starting to get more and more ingredients available over time, you'll have to strain it out, pull out the seeds, do all the little inconvenient things that stick in your teeth. Um, but. I have access to tamarind concentrate in Lexington, Kentucky. I have access to every ingredient I need in Lexington, Kentucky. That's unheard of. We used to have to bring curry powders back with us. We used to have to bring, you know, giant. We have, a, we have an umami bomb called a Maldive fish. It is sun-dried. It is kind of the similar texture to wood at that point. And Nobody here has it. The closest thing is Benito, but it doesn't have that same texture and it doesn't have that same salt factor. So we'd have to make do. We would either bring it in and share it among all of us, or we'd find an, a suitable substitute. Um, I should probably make pie crust if I'm making a pie, huh? So I am not a trained chef. I have been in you know, a bunch of different industries and, and doing a bunch of stuff over the last couple of years but uh, I am definitely not a pastry chef. So in the accessibility discussion, I had to have a pie crust that I could actually make. The food processor is my best friend. But one of the ways that I try to sneak my culture and sneak my flavors in familiar vehicles is by the use of spices. So you've got some turmeric here. Turmeric is across so many cultures. And some black pepper. Black pepper is widely grown down there. A little bit of salt, salt's everywhere. <laughs> you think of it as a country of tea and cuisine. But as I was experimenting with this, you find a lot of errors that you make and you find ways to fix them. One of them is if you add turmeric too late to a dough, it looks like a zebra and that not, does not taste good. So we blend everything up at once. Make everything be friends, make everything incorporate. And that's something that I try to push with the students here as well. When we were making roti, you're working coconut into the flour. You want it to be evenly distributed. So from here, I'm gonna add a bunch of butter because butter makes everything better. Whoop. There we go. Pulse it till crumbly. crumbly and then use a little bit of cold water and this was actually a, a fun way to create a somewhat bulletproof pie crust that everyone could make I am totally gonna spill in a second so just warning y'all now So the thing is, is that this should be making a ball. However, it is sneaking out on the sides. Thank you. 
The nice thing about what I've gotten to do, though, is I've turned, you know, a corner in Lexington and a dodgy neighborhood into a kokthu roti stand. I was able to bring Sri Lankan street food and all of its characteristics in and really kind of show it off and also make the entire neighborhood smell delicious. It's a way to get through to people that gives them the opportunity to get to know you before... Oh. That's what it was supposed to do. It did it. <laughs> Um, but I got to mix a ton of different flavors. I was doing like bacon and egg, curry, rotis, and it was absurd, but it gives me so much room to play. So for the pie filling, I decided that my problem with tomato pie was that it was like soggy on the bottom. And so I figured cheese and mayonnaise make a perfect layer. We layered them up and covered it up with dried out tomatoes because I did not want them to be soggy onto it. And we mixed in some traditional chilies, some red pepper, and some onions, because that is the base of a very good Sri Lankan style cheese toast. So while we were doing all these things and, and kind of developing it, it became obvious to me that the tomato was probably the perfect vehicle for a summer recipe as well. And with this roasted curry powder blend, as I actually have it blended with salt right now, it brought in so much flavor. It brought in so much depth. You had notes of cumin and coriander. You had the herbaceousness of the curry leaves. You had a little bit of cinnamon that you didn't know where it came from. And so it's, it's a journey. It's a journey through my childhood. It's a journey through the snacks I like to eat. But to say that, you know, you, you don't come halfway around the world to bring your B game. You just don't. You don't leave everything you know. And one of the common threads among all of us is that we have families that had very strong viewpoints and very strong views on food, very strong views on what food should be. That has impacted how I cook to this day. And that will always impact how I cook. So I'm going to Magic of Television this because I've got one done already. <laughs> Voila. A little toasty. But you have something that is equal parts pizza and equal parts delightful. And who can really argue with a bunch of tomatoes and cheese? Not me. Words to live by. So in short, try all the things. Give them familiar vehicles to try new flavors. That way you blow their minds. You have someone who will walk up to you and say, I don't like coconut, I don't like curry. And I'm like, well, you just ate a whole bowl of it. There. What? My favorite is the person who says, I don't like curry. I said, what don't you like about it? Oh, the curry spice, it's, it's just too much. And I'm like, which spice? Curry. Curry is not a spice. It is a blend. <laughs> and if you really think about it, a gumbo can be a curry. A stew can be a boring young can be a curry. You know, we all have these touch points that are common. So if we use those commonalities, to share flavors, to share influences, to share, to share cultures. We can't lose. There's so many amazing chefs in this country who are driving this first-gen discussion and driving the direction in food. And for that, I am grateful, and that is something that I want to see more of. But also, I want to see people using our spices, learning about our spices, finding out what makes it good, going beyond butter, salt, and pepper. So thank you all for having me. I appreciate you. I hope you had some pie yesterday. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you to all of our presenters for coming and sharing their perspectives here. This has been fantastic. I hope you got to try some of this pie at the marketplace last night. If not, you've got the recipe. She just talked you through it. If you can smell what I'm smelling right now, I'm sure you're probably going to uh, want to make it as well. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Chandra, for bringing us through that session. We've got one more amazing session before we are going to lunch, so hold tight. And to guide us through this next session, I'm so pleased to welcome Kathy Nash Holly, who is the publisher and editor in chief of Flavor and the Menu, uh, the magazine. Um, she's been publisher and editor in chief since the magazine began nearly 20 years ago. And Kathy is based in Maine, so she's actually joining us all the way from all um, from across the country. So please help me welcome Kathy Nash Holly.
Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much for the introduction. All right, we have a tall order here, right? Uh, we are standing between you and lunch, and we're going to uh, tighten it up, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on introductions, but we are going to be introducing two chefs who are spanning the country themselves um, between Oakland and New York. And first up, we are going to, uh, according to schedule, is uh, Chef Nelson, Nelson German. And he is Oakland-based, uh, born in New York, uh, Dominican heritage, uh, so he infuses a lot of those flavors and culinary ingredients into his, his kind of culinary culture. Um, excited to see what you have on tap for us here. But right now, he is the chef owner of Alamar, both Alamar and Sober Mesa in Oakland. Alamar is more of a seafood-centric concept. Sober Mesa is Afro-Latino, cocktail focus, tapas, right? Um, and it's worth noting that uh, he was um, named a chef to watch by my friends at Plate Magazine last year, so congrats on that. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's take it away. I think we have a video to show first, so first we want to welcome Chef Nelson German. Thank you guys, thank you. Thank you. So I forgot to mention, I was, I was this past season's top chef, so you gotta watch, huh? Season 18. Oh, great, yes, sorry, <laughs> you should have mentioned that. Uh, but it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, it's so amazing to see the passion, that there is still passion in this industry. Uh, the diversity that's growing, it's really special. Um, I'm born and raised in New York City, from Washington Heights, where I've been in Oakland for 12 years now. Um, it's my home. Oakland gave me my first two places at 40 years old, um, grinding through this industry, traveling the world, um, just absorbing as much knowledge as I can from everyone around you. Um, anyone who ever says there's you know, they're self-taught for everything. There's people around you that you can learn from. You're always learning from somebody, even from a dishwasher, from a prep cook, any little thing that can, you can see that catches your eye and is knowledgeable, you take in and use that in your future. You'll always remember something you, you saw from like 20 years ago. That could be an inspiration for something you're making new at the moment, so always remember that. Um, I'm gonna make two dishes real quick for you guys too, two that really uh, represent who I am. One is a shrimp criolla, something my mom used to cook for us every Sunday uh, for special occasions, usually. Uh, when I get good grades or a sports team wins, anything like that, she'll bring out the shrimp. Uh, it's really delicious. It's something I make at Alamar, which is more seafood focus. Uh, the other one is a suya style uh, Ethiopian spice shrimp. So really diving into my roots. I am Dominican nationality, but as being Dominican, we're part of the African diaspora. So we have a lot of ties to Africa. And in this time in my career, I'm really focusing on that. I'm calling a lot of my food Pan-African. It's something even you guys, whoever saw the show this year, Top Chef, there was one episode where we got to see Pan-African cuisine and really get inspired by that. Um, it's, it is my purpose and the way I came out of the show is really like how to make my food better, how to go deeper into my roots, because people want that now. That's the specialty about this industry now. Things are changing. Um, other cuisines and other cultures are being respected now. You know, not seeing it as low of the mill. There's, from the previous beautiful chefs that, that came and cooked for you guys and showed you something that's really not known, and it should be known, should be respected. Um, and see the diversity within our industry, it's, it's a good time to be in it. You know, now's a, a great time for us to really cook with our hearts and not just think about doing French, Italian, and Spanish. You can still bring those techniques in to, the, to the, your food, but really diving into what makes you happy. You know, so definitely learn about that. Always have that as, as a tip in the back of your mind. Cook with your hearts all the time. Come from inspiration, whether it's from traveling, from a memory, from anything that makes you happy, and just cook. You know, like these dishes here, they, they were inspired by something I used to love as a kid, is shrimp scampi. First time I had shrimp scampi, I fell in love. I was like, this is delicious, so simple. You just have some bread on the side, you dip it in, it's this beautiful sauce, and it's absolutely fantastic. But the more I thought about it, in my career, I was like, this, this is a little familiar to me. And I remember my mom cooking this dish, and it was like basically shrimp scampi, Dominican style, you know? Uh, There's just a few things that were switched. Instead of the lemon, you find shrimp scampi, we use lime. Instead of the chili flakes, we use actual peppers. Uh, but there's still the garlic, there's still the, the herbs. Instead of parsley, we use cilantro. So there's a lot of similarities to things. And that's the way you gotta think about things that, something you might love from a different culture or a different cuisine, 
could be something that you actually grew up with, with a nice twist. So that's how you always can make something your own. Come from inspiration, again, something you used to love to eat, something you learn from traveling, from another chef. And the way you make it your own, you go back into your memories. Something your grandma cooked, your, your mom, something that made you really happy as a kid. You bring that back, and when people feel that, and feel the, the love and soul in your food, you got them. That's how you keep your restaurants open. That's how you still survive in this industry, because it's, it's a lot. When you own your own business, it's a lot more than just being a chef. You have to be an owner, too. So you have to cook your ass off. <laughs> right, I'm going to turn these on. So I'm going to have two pans real quick. So for the, the West African style shrimp, I'm going to use head on, shell on. So more like a seafood boil. For my shrimp criollo, I'm going to use peeled shrimp. So a lot of ingredients here. Uh, the cool thing about this too, I made a Ethiopian spice butter, compound butter for this dish. So that's one thing you guys should think about too, even at home or in your, when you have your own menus, compound butters are really special. You can build a lot of flavors into these things and it takes, there's not much storage to it. You create the butter with all these beautiful seasonings. Instead of you standing there and having all these things in front of you, it could be overwhelming, especially when you're busy and in the weeds. You have something that's already made that is packed with flavor and the dish is going to come out super fast. So when you have your own restaurants, always think about that too. Always have dishes that are, it could take a long time to prep and you put a lot of love into that, but when it comes to picking up the dish to, for service, it has to be quick. Less than five minutes because people don't like to wait. No matter how happy they're, they're, they are to be in your restaurant, if they're hungry or hangry like we call it, that food better come out fast. That's how you keep them. So even if you're thinking like appetizers to be fast and the entrees can take a little longer, always, always remember, find ways of making the system of creating this dish and still have all the flavor and love that you want to have it in, have in the dish, be fast. All right. Sorry, I feel like I'm on, I'm on a quick fire right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of are. <laughs> all right. How much time? So again, I have two, two pans. My shrimp criolla in the small one, cast iron. I love using cast iron. Cast iron is the best thing to use. Uh, stainless steel is great too, but cast iron is something about it. It just cooks faster. It doesn't allow the sauce to break as easily as other pans. And it doesn't overheat. You don't need to have high heat to cook with this. So I'm going to keep it on medium. All right. Well, you guys are hungry, so I'm going to even make you even hungrier. Mm -hmm where this dish is going to look. Let me get my, my tongs. All right, I'm going to start in the small one. So I'm going to add my garlic. Thank you so much. Sorry. Right here. One little tip, make sure you have all the tools that you mm -hmm. need to cook. Now some garlic. That. The other dish already has garlic in the compound butter, but I love garlic so much, I'm gonna add some in here too. Gonna go a little bit rustic. This is something, as a chef, you have to multitask. So if you're cooking two dishes that are totally separate, you gotta go for it, you gotta do it. All right. Adding these shrimp. I'm gonna cook each side for about 30 seconds. So I'm adding my other ingredients. I already pre-marinated these head-on prawns in my suya spice. You guys have the recipe for that. Suya is a really delicious spice mix. A lot, there's cardamom, there's allspice, cumin, paprika, achiote. It's a really delicious African spice mix. Usually used for suya, which are skewers. So skewered meats or seafood at the grill. Add a little bit more oil to here. So again, remember the inspiration is from Scampi and also childhood memory. So the garlic is in there. And then cook, we're gonna add some wine to here. And if you are afraid of fire, remember the trick is take the pan away. Also, there's a lot of oil. You tip it down 
so nothing splashes in you, and you can add your wine. When you put it back on, you're gonna get this beautiful flambe. You do it on the heat, it's gonna come up. For a lot of chefs, we, we don't mind that. People who are new to cooking might be a little scary. So you always wanna take it off the flame or just turn it off. Same thing here, I'll show you if I have it on. It's gonna splash, by the way. So much. Gonna add my peppers here. Look at the beautiful colors on that. A little shake. For this next one, I'm gonna add a little bit of lemon juice, some wine. I have another thing of wine. It's a little citrus zest. It's a little bit of lime. It's got a little lemon. It's a little twist. So I'm not cooking exactly like my mom used to. It's, it's a little chefy. So I'm adding some, uh, some zest in there to add some more flavor. more wine here and I'm adding some a little bit of shrimp stock uh, in your recipe there's lobster stock on there I was surprised to see shrimp stock which is amazing because we are cooking shrimp look at the color on that it's looking gorgeous can anyone smell this mm -hmm. oh, yeah <laughs> uh, I'm gonna twist the shrimp here And now I'm gonna add my butter. So regular butter for the criolla. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of butter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll see why. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then I need the compound butter. This one. Yellow one. Ah, here it is. Everything's behind me. <laughs> All right, so not too much in this one. This is a compound butter. Look at the beautiful color on that. Mm -hmm. So there's turmeric, ginger, paprika. <clears throat> going light there? <laughs> yeah, the bread is going to go for this one. It's all good. Add a little more stock. What did you say was in the compound turmeric? Say again? In the compound butter? Uh, turmeric, ginger, paprika. Okay. Achiote or anato seed, they call it. Nice. A little bit of fennel seed and uh, allspice. Great. And remember, this dish is for two people. So the amount of butter is for two people. It's not for one person. Yeah. <laughs> Could be for me, but not for the normal crowd. You can also use all these new plant-based butters, too, to create this dish to be a little bit on the healthier side. Alright guys, letting this thicken up a bit. Gonna add a little more of my seasoning. A little salt and pepper mix. Also added some Dominican seasonings, some secret ones. Add some more color. It's creating a nice beautiful sauce. Okay, chef, you're down to your last few seconds. What you got for us? Alright, let's start plating. <coughs> Probably felt like a quick fire. Alright, so I'm gonna do eat the open here. Shrimp criolla here. That's beautiful. Ready to cook. I'm going to start plating. And I made a beautiful wild rice for this dish. Instead of regular white rice, I'm going to pour the sauce. And remember, seafood is very delicate. So you don't want to cook it for too long. That's why it's a beautiful dish. They can create as an appetizer or an entree. This is an entree size or family style like we like to cook at Alamar. Ooh. That here. Beautiful saucepan. Let's go for it. Get that sauce. Yeah. Nice. All right, so wild rice is so in here. So I cooked it with sofrito. I can send over that recipe. Sofrito is a beautiful mix of peppers, cilantro, a lot of garlic, seasonings, onions, 
and a little bit of heat, I use uh, Fezzo peppers. Beautiful. So it has a lot of great flavor. Look at this here, a little parsley. All right, how am I doing, good? Okay, You're, we're a little <laughs> over, but it's looking good. All right. And finishing so bread. up bread for soaking up all that beautiful compound butter. I got some beautiful geraniums. Oh, oh nice, yes. Just, we love playing with flowers now, right? <laughs> really beautiful. <laughs> there we go. Nice, Chef. Bam. Thank you so much. Hi, right, guys. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. You have the two beautiful dishes. Again, these are family-style dishes you can enjoy with your family, with friends, uh, someone special in your life. This means a lot to me. So thank you for allowing me to do this. Thank you for sharing. Cheers. All right, moving right into our, our next chef. Chef Scott Alvis Bart Barton is a chef scholar, which would be an easiest way to sum up his role. Um, he's an adjunct professor at NYU with a long career in um, as an executive chef, consultant, uh, educator. Um, and he has a specialty focus in Brazilian culture and culinary uh, history there. Um, he even had a recent class, which I was intrigued by this in 2020, on um, explore, exploring inclusivity through food, which is really a really topical theme right now. Welcome, Chef. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I was supposed to get a clicker, so I, I have a little slideshow. Oh, here you go. Um, thank you. I want to um, pay respects to Constance, Pauline, Eugenia, and Sylvia, my great-grandmother, my two grandmothers, and my mother. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Mm -hmm. And just as a quick aside, because I don't have very little time, when I was about eight, my mother came to me crying and asked me if I would change my middle name. I was born Scott Allen Barton, and she, the girl child she had had died, and she knew her name would be lost. So she asked if I could have her middle name put in my middle name. And we had to go to court, and she cried. And I said, yeah, mom, sure, no problem. The first day I go to Brazil, I do research in Brazil over 12 years, 15 years, and they look at my past where they go, Scott Alves, você é brasileiro? And immediately I was accepted. So having that middle name, my mother did this. She was mm -hmm. dead when I had this exchange. But I felt like she gave me a gift. Mm -hmm. That is I a gift. I was asked to, to talk about and cook from Brazil predominantly. And we're going to go both in indigenous and Afro-Brazilian dishes. You see on your screen uh, mandioca or cassava or yuca. And you see on the, for me, the right side, a moqueca. Moqueca is one of the classic dishes of Bahia, one of the classic uh, dishes of uh, Afro-Brazilian cooking. I think if I do this. Really quick one run through in the streets of Bahia, you see street food vendors selling tapioca or beiju. Beiju, if I say beijo, we're going to kiss. If I say beiju, we're going to eat uh, a tapioca pancake or crepe. It's crispy, uh, it's very plain, plainer than a potato chip, so it takes a lot of flavor. Um, we had a little Epic, near epic fail yesterday trying to get the right kind of tapioca flour. We all know tapioca has many uses, including the starch on your clothing. I'm going to try to run through because I know that you want to eat. Um, I'm not going to do that much demonstration. I'll make some of it, but I want to give you a sense of the product. And so you see the states that you would peel the cassava or mandioca. And <clears throat> as we all know, it's got a little bit of an arsenic related poison in it. So we have to either ferment it, boil it, roast it, grill it, fry it to take that out. So in this case, uh, we grated it. We have grated right here. And we ended up using straight grated tapioca because I didn't have the flour I would like. But <clears throat> your grandmother, if you were Brazilian or South American, Central American, would grate it, squeeze out the liquid. Uh, some of the starch would come. You would dry it, uh, puree it if you hadn't, it wasn't fine enough, and then use it to make beiju. You might need to strain it, as this is done here. And you get this result. So I have these right here. I'll try to make one. You can do it with almost no oil. And the thing that I want you to think about, if you didn't try it last night in the tasting, ooh, that's hot, is um, the fact that it's, I almost don't need the oil if I have a nonstick pan. It cooks very quickly. It absorbs, it's 
The street food vendors make them sweet or savory. And so it absorbs any flavor. And as we know, the starch that is existent in cassava is so strong, it will adhere to itself. We make cakes with it, uh, farofa, the topping you see in a lot of savory dishes. You can make pirao, a polenta-like mush. I'll let that cook for a minute, and I can flip it. While that's cooking, I'm just going to set up the plate. We, we made a um, dosi jabubara, or a pumpkin sweet, a confit made from roasted pumpkin cooked with crude brown sugar, cinnamon and cloves, the classic savory and sweet spices in Bahia. And then a very simple, I should put my right to flip. Of course, in front of you, I didn't get a good flip. <laughs> nice. And I would say, if I had the flour, you saw that kind of whitish edge. If I had the flour that's very granular as opposed to... So there's a flour for beiju that's more like our cornmeal. And then there's um, cassava flour, tapioca flour, you can get it uh, probably Trader Joe's or Whole Foods and these kind of stores. That is very fine, like uh, 10x. And so that's the distinction. It was a very simple dish, so we did a little toasted coconut. And I, reke uh, shao is a between a cream cheese and a mascarpone that's very popular in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And I just had a little bit um, of cayenne pepper and a little bit of sugar added to this. I'll say this, when I was working on my PhD, uh, I went to, there's a system of schools in Brazil called Senaque, that would be the equivalent of the CIA. Um, but there's 50, if it was the United States, there'd be 50 of them. And the 50 schools would have one in every state, and you would learn all the things you learn at a culinary program like the CIA, but you would also learn the regional cooking of the state. Mm -hmm. And so I went and took the regional cooking of the state, and I don't have a knife. You're going to imagine me cutting this and putting the top of it in a minute. Thank you so much. And so I took regional cooking. And so if you make it in a, a metate, a mortar and pestle, that's what you would do. And the one thing the chefs told me that they changed was they reduced the sugar in the colonial desserts by 50 to 70 percent. Wow. And they were still very sweet. Mm -hmm. So we cut back on the sugar here. There's that one as a hero. Um, but it's still fairly sweet. Very quickly, because I'm probably almost out of time, you're hungry for lunch, I'm going to really quickly run you through a moqueca. Moqueca is a classic seafood stew. Oh, have I lost my thing? Well, you're not going to yep. get that image. I started it already. I've made it lighter. This is an homage to, oh, here we go, thank you. Beto Pimentel in the restaurant Paraíso Tropical in Bahia. Oh, I went too fast. So, um, there's an a adage. If you're going to make moqueca for someone, if you have shrimp, make it with shrimp. If you don't have shrimp, make it with fish. If you don't have fish, make it with eggs. If you don't have eggs, make it with lung. If you don't have lung, make it with jackfruit. Mm. Okay? <laughs> so uh, what we did already was we sweat some onions and sweet peppers and a little bit of Fresno chili. I'm using cooked shrimp to be faster for you. I don't need this. From there, we put, um, I made this lighter, so it's got a four to one ratio of coconut water to coconut milk. At this point, I would normally put in raw shrimp and bring it to a boil, but I poached the shrimp because of time. Um, so what I'm gonna do now to finish it, heat it up. So this is moqueca. If you're in Bahia, you can also get something called asopao. And when you get it as a moqueca, you're getting an emulsion of at the finish of palm oil and uh, olive oil. So I don't see my palm oil. 
Okay, we're gonna get an Aso Pau, because they didn't give me my palm oil. Like, no, here it is, I see, it's thick, okay. Um, and if you get an Aso Pau, it has no palm oil. Okay, so it's a little bit lighter. And in Brazil, they like it uh, often. Can I have my thing back to show them the last images? Um, some people like it very readily. Uh, dear friends of mine, these are the Rainas, or the queens of Moqueca in Bahia. It's a very famous dish. And this is a dear, dear friend, Josival Santos, who he and his uh, husband, uh, his husband does a lot of art with food and Josue Val is a chef. And for an art installation, they made a moqueca for a community. And you see how big the pot. And wow. So to give you a sense of how important this dish is in the community and in the culture. So to finish this one, you see here, we use fresh coconut meat, which is also why I used coconut water more than coconut milk. I'm going to add to it. I'm just letting this get hot. I know you're almost out of time because you I have a minute and 40 seconds left. Mm -hmm. So lunch is coming soon. Um, I have palm hearts. We're going to make it a little bit different. I have, we're going to make it with fresh fruit, tropical fruit. Obviously, it was hard to get all the fruit I wanted, so we are substituting. As I've heard other people today, work with what you have. Think about the flavor profiles you want if you don't have. So I wanted something that was tart fruit, so we have blackberries and... and um, pomegranate instead of acerola cherries, and I can't think of the other one offhand that we're gonna get that would be more tropical. But you do what you can. Mm -hmm. So to finish, I'm just gonna walk you through these and I'm gonna add it. So I have palm hearts, scallions, a little garlic, cilantro, um, scallion white, scallion green, octopus, oh, so you're supposed to have crab meat and oysters, and somebody in the kitchen took my crab meat and oysters. Oh. <laughs> So we're going to have uh, octopus, right. cod, and shrimp. So I'm just heating this a little bit. Obviously, since the seafood is hot and cooked, I don't really want to get it too hot, but I am supposed to make an emulsion, and the interesting thing is palm oil can be solid at room temperature. So I'm going to try to play the game right now. But ding. And just so you know, if we were in Bahia, when it's made in a restaurant, they usually make it over uh, open flame, or ideally a wooden fire, a, a wood-based fire, in those um, ceramic pots that Paula Wolford enjoys that you can cook with, that are unglazed, and it comes to the table like that to you, and usually bubbling furiously. So. Hopefully, we can get this to get a little more heat. I got 18 seconds. Okay, we're gonna talk you through this so you can get your lunch. You're gonna pretend that it's boiling furiously. We're actually 18 seconds over, but we're, okay. uh, that's all right, that's all right. You can, you can do this. Now, obviously, right. one of the things you'll see, and if you're scheduled to come to the demonstration I'm gonna do later today, yeah. I will also use palm oil, but palm oil changes food's color. It will redden everything. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, and I mentioned Beto Pimentel, and this is important. He has a five or 800 hectare garden adjacent to his restaurant in Salvador. And almost everything other than the seafood, you get out of the garden so you can see the food, the fruits and stuff growing, the um, guinea fowl and chickens, etc. His, which I can't do in this country, he makes with palm fruits. And we need to understand that Palm oil has a lot of um, history, a woman's agricultural product in West Africa. We associate it with deforestation, destruction of orangutan habitat, etc. in Southeast Asia. In a traditional, and my work over this few days is all about really the Columbian Exchange, Alfred Crosby's Columbian Exchange, what came between Africa, the Americas, and Europe things like chickens and pigs and horses for here. But we really don't talk about what the Africans bring or what, what, excuse me, what went to Africa. And so I've used ingredients. The agusi soup yesterday is a cousin to watermelon seed, the melon seed. Here, the, um, we're using um, cassava that goes from uh, Brazil to the Americas. Um, and palm oil obviously comes and it's something that we use in a sacred and secular way. So in essence, Beto's 
because it grows there, he would have fresh palm fruit, which is an omega-3. But when we mix the palm fruit oil with the palm um, nut oil, it becomes a saturated fat. And there's a big distinction. Mm -hmm. Historically, Africans would use the saturated fat on their hair and skin and the fruit in their food. But now, industrially, it gets mixed. So for the time being, because I'm way over time, uh -huh. You're imagining that this is simmering really it's rapidly. It's beautiful. We can see it. It does can taste it. good. I would serve it to you, but this is the demonstration where you only get to look. Yes. Have Thank a good you one. so much, Chef. Thank you so much. And thank you also to Kathy for moderating that last session, as I think has been hinted about a thousand times by now. It is finally lunchtime, um, which is why we're trying to rush the chefs so that we can get you all out to the hot, delicious food happening outside. So we are um, going back to our world marketplace, um, which will be outside, same as last night, on the second floor in the mezzanine throughout the museum. There's additional seating also throughout the building, so please feel Feel free um, to to spread out, and then we will be back here on the main stage for more content at 2:15. So please enjoy lunch. The Culinary Institute of America at Copia, in collaboration with Butter of Europe is pleased to bring you Baking and Pastry Excellence, a free online educational series featuring the best in world baking and pastry. Today, we'll visit the Manresa Bakery in Los Gatos, California, with head baker Avery Rizika. Let's listen as Chef Rizika tells us the secrets to making her scrumptious corn flour sable featuring creamy French butter. Sables are a traditional French butter cookie with crushed corn added to the dough for a crispy crunch. Hi, my name's Avery Rizika. I'm the partner, founder, and head baker at Manresa Bread in Los Gatos. Today we're gonna make the corn flour sable. We start by taking our sugar, we're using granulated sugar, and then one whole egg and one egg yolk, and we are gonna combine those in a mixer um, with the paddle attachment. Uh, we're gonna mix those till they're like a light golden color, really light and fluffy. We're trying to beat air into the cookie at this point. Um, and then we're going to add our butter. Um, our butter should be room temperature, so it should be soft. It shouldn't be warm, but it should be malleable. And then we're going to incorporate all of that into the sugar and the egg mixture. And we're gonna beat it for about two minutes until it also gets kind of smooth and slightly fluffy. We are going to add all of our flour as well as um, lemon juice, a little salt, and uh, half a vanilla bean. And the flours we're using are an AP flour and a corn flour. Um, you don't have to sift the flours for this recipe. The corn flour we mill here, when you think about like what polenta feels like versus um, what this corn flour would feel like, this is gonna be softer. It's gonna really feel almost like a regular flour. And so it's, it's quite fine. Incorporate the flour into the butter, sugar, egg mixture, and then we can chill the dough or we can go ahead and roll it at that point. And so we roll it out. You could do a couple different things. I roll it on the our sheeter. You could roll it with a rolling pin. I sheeted the dough because I think that sheeting it gives me a really even, consistent product, um, and it's the most efficient for me. And so we sheet the dough, and I sheeted it down to about a quarter of an inch, and then I cut it out with a one-inch fluted cutter. Um, I baked the dough or baked the cookie at this point at uh, 345 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for six minutes. If I made a slightly larger cookie, I probably would push that bake time to about eight or nine minutes. And then that's the, the whole cookie. And the cookies can also be cut and frozen, or they could even be baked and frozen after baking. For the sable recipe, I like Butter of Europe because I want a really rich flavor to come through. The butter is gonna help a lot with the texture of the sable uh, because it's such a simple cookie. Um, the butter is really what binds the cookie together. There's very little egg in this cookie, but then when you bake it, it has like this beautiful flavor to it. Watch more baking and pastry videos at ciaproshef.com slash butter.
Hi, I'm Chef Andrew Hunter with Kikoman Sales USA. Today we're going to make a roasted mushroom katsu. Traditionally, katsu is made with chicken or pork, but we're going to use roasted mushrooms for a plant-based version. Let's get started by prepping our mushrooms. Here I have some beautiful portobellos that I've stemmed and degilled, as well as some nice meaty king trumpet mushrooms that I've trimmed, halved, and scored with diamond shapes. Preheat an oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Blend three parts of peanut oil to one part of Kikoman toasted sesame oil. Toss the portobellos in the oil blend to coat and season with salt and pepper. Roast the portobellos in the oven for 25 to 30 minutes or until they're soft and caramelized. For the king trumpet mushrooms, heat a saute pan over medium heat, add the oil blend with a little butter. Add smashed garlic and ginger to infuse the flavors for a few seconds. Now add the mushrooms, cut side down and sear until golden brown. Flip and cook on the other side for a minute or two to finish. Now we'll make the breading. Prepare the tempura batter using Kikoman tempura mix according to the package instructions. Fill a bowl with panko. Dip the mushrooms in the tempura batter and dredge in the panko pressing lightly on the mushrooms to make sure the panko sticks. Arrange the mushrooms on a sheet pan and refrigerate until you're ready to fry. I'll show you a quick trick to make the garnish. Here I have a thin chiffonade of Napa or Savoy cabbage. Put the chiffonade in a container filled with ice water and refrigerate covered. The cold cabbage will be a refreshing counterpoint to the crispy hot katsu. Let's get frying. Fry a portobello cap until golden brown and remove it from the oil. Cut the portobellos into strips and fan out on the plate. Arrange the trumpet mushrooms next to the portobello. Serve with rice and garnish the plate with a pinch of shredded cabbage, carrots, and green onions. Season with a drizzle of Kikoman rice vinegar. Top the rice with the sauteed garlic and ginger from the King Trumpet Mushroom Pan. Drizzle Kikoman Katsu sauce over the mushrooms and serve. I hope you enjoy this delicious plant-based version of a traditional katsu. Looking for plant-based barbecue recipe? Here's a bold, flavor-packed recipe for fire-roasted kohlrabi served with a salad of tomatoes and feta cheese and drizzled with a tangy lemon za'atar dressing. First, preheat a gas grill, turning on half of the burners on one side of the grill and leaving the other side off. Place a few layers of foil on the half-baking tray and place the kohlrabi on top. Rub the kohlrabi with oil and season with salt and pepper, then wrap the kohlrabi with the foil. Place on the side of the grill without the fire. Turn after approximately 45 minutes and open up the foil. Cover the lid and cook for another 45 minutes to one hour longer or until the exterior is charred and the interior is tender when you pierce with a skewer. If the kohlrabi is getting too smoky, finish in a hot oven. Let cool slightly and peel. Next, we'll sear our tomatoes. Heat a saute pan over high heat. Add the oil and tomatoes and saute until the tomatoes are slightly charred and just starting to wilt. Season with salt and pepper. To serve, cut the kohlrabi into eighth, cutting almost all the way through, but leaving it together at the bottom. Place the kohlrabi on a platter and sprinkle it with mold and salt. Place the tomatoes and herbs around the platter Drizzle the Hellman's Lemon Zatar dressing over the kohlrabi and tomatoes. The Hellman's Lemon Zatar dressing adds a citrusy, Middle Eastern flavor profile to any dish. Sprinkle with feta cheese and zatar. So here's our finished plate. Fire roasted whole kohlrabi served with salad of tomatoes and feta cheese, drizzled with a tangy lemon zatar dressing. Delicious.
The big, bold flavors in this ramen bowl are hearty enough for any Shogun warrior. We're upgrading the pork cutlet in this traditional Japanese soup with sweet and smoky sliced ham. A rich broth is key for delicious ramen. In this recipe, I'm going to make a flavorful pork broth. Heat a large stock pot on high. Add vegetable oil and heat to lightly smoky. Add onions, ginger, and garlic, and cook, tossing as needed until deeply charred on most sides. Add rib bones, pork scraps, and season with salt. Continue cooking until you have a nice color on the pork. Add the diced ham and cook until browned. Add leeks, scallions, mushrooms, star anise, chilies, and top with chicken stock. Bring to a boil over high heat, skimming off any foam as needed. Reduce heat to low and bring to a simmer. Continue cooking until broth is slightly viscous, approximately six to eight hours. Make sure to add water as necessary to keep the bones submerged at all times. Strain the broth and cook it over medium heat. It should be reduced to approximately six cups. Combine the pork broth and miso paste. Bring this broth to a boil, then turn off the heat. Slice the ham into julienne strips and saute until nicely browned. For service, place cooked noodles into a large soup bowl. Add a few shiitake mushrooms, half a soft boiled egg, a handful of baby spinach leaves, scallions, sesame oil, togarashi, lime juice, chili oil, rice vinegar, and furikake on top of the noodles. Ladle the broth on top. Place the ham slices in the bowl and serve. So there you have it. Soup suitable for a Shogun warrior. Spicy ham ramen. Banzai. Find this recipe and many more at ciaprochef.com slash ham. Hi, I'm Tony Roberts. I'm the pastry chef at the Ritz Carlton Chicago. Today we're celebrating the worlds of flavor with the perfect puree of Napa Valley. So we're going to start the day in Montreal for breakfast with black pepper ham and Emmental crepes with the perfect puree peach ginger blend and maple sauce. And then we're going to follow up with the butter. I'm going to switch to a whisk here. Just get the butter in and just whisk until the butter is melted in. And Emmental cheese and ham, we're going to give it a fold, give it another fold. So we're just going to pour this right over the top. And then to finish, some fresh black pepper 
and some chopped herbs. Today I have some chive, and there you go. A beautiful brunch or breakfast dish. Next up on our culinary journey, we're stopping in Mexico City for vegetarian cauliflower tacos with a peach ginger slaw. We are going to add our peach ginger blend. So here we have our coleslaw, everything's in. We have our peach ginger blend, it smells so good. Some white vinegar, fresh lime juice, and some toasted chopped pepitas. So we're just gonna take our plate here. I have our warm corn tortillas. I'm gonna do a little bit of the spicy mayo. A few crispy fried onions. And there you have it. Roasted cauliflower tacos with the peach ginger slaw. So we're finishing our day with some sweets in Sao Paulo. And go ahead and blend it smooth. So here we have our brigadero mixture. And then from here, just use a little ice cream scoop or you can use a spoon or something else. And you're just going to make little balls, pop them out and then in your hands, roll them nicely into a little ball. And here I have some yellow nonpareil sprinkles and some orange to celebrate the peach ginger colors. We're just gonna take our little ball, roll it in here, cover it in the sprinkles. And then these just get placed in bonbon cups, ready for your guests. I've had so much fun on this culinary journey with the perfect puree of Napa Valley. We began our day in Montreal where we made black pepper ham and Emmental crepes with a peach ginger sauce. Next up, we headed to Mexico City to prepare vegetarian roasted cauliflower tacos with a peach ginger slaw. Then we ended our day with sweets in San Palio with peach ginger brigaderos. Again, all of these recipes can be found at www.perfectpuree.com WOF. While you're there, remember to check out our complimentary sample program and try all of the flavors for yourself. Enjoy.